I'm Sister Mary Rose, and um, I'm so grateful to God for this opportunity, especially that it's coming on um, February 5th, which is one of my favorite saints, St. Saint Agatha. I just love St. Agatha. And so I want to I want to begin again by praying another Hail Mary, and you probably think that's all we do is pray, but <laughs> but but it's <laughs> but you know um, Our Lady one time, well Saint Teresa of Avila, she died in um, 1579, I think. But when when she died, um, a sister was praying for her, and she the Lord allowed her appear to to appear to that sister, and she said to the sister. You know, I'd be willing to come back and pray in my body until the end of time for the reward that God gives for one Hail Mary in heaven. One. You know, so we said a lot of them today. <laughs> but but l l why is that so? Well, think about um, when we read in the Gospel of St. Luke, when Mary greeted her cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the same thing occurs when we say the Hail Mary, we're saying hello to our Blessed Mother. And she greets us in return, and we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're praising Jesus, because we say, Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So, so let's join in that Hail Mary, and um, let's pray for the parish, as Monsignor Quinn asked us to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Saint Joseph, protector of the church and terror of demons, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so, you know, what was coming to me in prayer upstairs was that there are some women here who think that God can't forgive them, that they've gone beyond the limit of God's mercy. And, and I, know the, I know what that feels like because um, like what Sister was saying is true, that I, I am a converted sinner. And um, I remember what, what that was like. I've been in the convent now for 41 years, but it seems like two years to me. It really does. But before I became a sister, um, when I was in college, I was so far away from the Lord, and I, I was an English major, and I was very, um, well, I don't know if any of you are English majors, but if you were, then it's like you can write a paper about any topic in the world, even if you know nothing about it. You, know, you can write at least one page. And, but, but, I mean, as it, at the time I was going to college, which, which was in the 70s, I mean, my first round of college, <laughs> um, like it was so uh, depressing, like English, like I think they chose the most depressing books for English literature, and it was like so um, nihilism, like like everything was just materialistic, like there was no um, transcendence at all, and so that's what I was immersed in that type of reading. But then also like with drugs and alcohol, I, I got to the point where um, to me I thought everything was. Subjective. I, I came to the point to think that reality was subjective, that it wasn't objective. It was all just in my own head. And so, um, and so my parents at that time um, sent me to my aunt in Pennsylvania, because like, they didn't know what to do with me. I was in my young 20s at that time. And um, so I remember going there, and um, at that point I really was in that insane state of mind where I thought, because I thought reality was subjective, I thought I had this responsibility to die, like for the healing of the world. That was how far off I had become mentally. And, um, but while I was there in Pennsylvania, my aunt gave me a plastic rosary, a blue plastic rosary and a brown scapular. I don't know if you know what the brown scapular looks like, but it's um, a sacramental that Our Lady gave in 1251 to St. Simon Stock, and she said that um, Whoever dies clothed in the, in the scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. And um, so, but I, I put on the brown scapular and then I began to pray the rosary. And I hadn't prayed in a long, long time. But as soon as I began to pray the rosary, immediately light came back into my mind. And it was like all of a sudden I wasn't insane anymore. And I could see that God had given me all these graces that I had been born into a Catholic family. I'd gone to Catholic school for 12 years. And um, I had thrown away all these graces, all these gifts that God had given me. I had just thrown them away. And so like, it was the Holy Spirit was convicting me of my sin in a very powerful way. 
And so the next morning, I mean, I went to into um, Philadelphia to the Church of St. Bridget's, and I went to confession. And I remember this elderly priest, after he heard my confession, he said, well, you could become a saint, you know. And I said, did you hear my confession? You know, <laughs> you know it, but, but that was the beginning of my conversion, but it was only the beginning. And I, I'd like to... You know, I'd like to tell you that as soon as I went to confession, ever after, I was like a holy sister, <laughs> a holy daughter of Mary. But that wasn't the case. You know, I was struggling back and forth. And, um, but, but the worst suffering for me during that whole year that I went through was thinking that I was damned. And um, I, this is like a special ploy of the devil that um, he puts it into our heart that we've gone beyond the mercy of God. And... Um, you know, heaven is for other people, but not for you, because um, you've just gone too far. And, um, and so I really, like, was tormented by this. The reason I thought I was damned was because I was misreading the gospel, where Jesus says, um, those who sin against the Holy Spirit never have forgiveness. And so I was thinking that because I was insane, because I thought reality was subjective, that I had sinned against the Holy Spirit. And so priests kept telling me, well, that's not what that means. You know, what it means is... To sin against the Holy Spirit means to refuse God's mercy. Because there's no sin that God won't forgive. But, but he, won't, he can't forgive people who don't receive his mercy. Because we have to open our hearts to receive his mercy. And so, I mean, I understand that now. But at the time, I didn't understand it. And, um, and so I kept praying. And um, I had alienated. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. But I had alienated all my friends I'd grown up with. Because, you know, I was always trying to convert them now, before I had been partying with them all the time. Now I was like always trying to get them to go to church with me, and um, like to the opposite extreme, which was very obnoxious. And I mean, <laughs> you know, my, my brother and sister still have not recovered, I don't think. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so my only friends at that point were, these, were my mother's friends, you know. You know, so I'd go out to Novenas with my mother and her friends, and um, you know, I just didn't have any friends of my own age, really. One woman I remember um, who helped me so much, she was from Ireland, and she was, she was a beggar, actually, in downtown Syracuse. I met her. Her name was Marianne Francis Ryan. And um, she helped me so much, you know, and um, just, like, giving me faith in God and, and giving me that courage to believe that, yes, God had forgiven me. But meanwhile, one of my mother's friends gave me a copy of True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. And so I read that book, and I... And I did the 33-day preparation of um, consecration to Jesus through Mary. And it happened to be that um, I was back in Philadelphia at the end of the 33 days. I was visiting one of my friends that I had grown up with. And um, so I was able to make that consecration in the shrine of Our Lady of the Miraculous Meadow in Germantown, Pennsylvania. And from that moment, which was March 25, 1980, our Blessed Mother took away that feeling that I was damned. She took it away. And so, um, and it's never come back. And um, she's also kept me out of mortal sin during all those years. It's like, it, it was like she took over my spiritual life. Um, and that's, that's what I think she wants to do for all of us, especially if you're tormented by that type of thinking that you can't be forgiven, or maybe that you can't forgive. That's, that's another type of torment. Like, because um, statistics show that... Um, there's a very high rate of abuse, that women have been abused, as children in particular. And so I'm sure that some of us in this room have been abused. And that's a hard thing to forgive. And it's a hard thing to forgive the Lord, because we think, um, where were you, Lord? And, and so, so we have to um, ask our Blessed Mother. We need her motherly kindness to come in and, and heal all those wounds. And she herself was wounded so that we could be forgiven. Because if you think about it, um, Our Lady says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And so that's what her soul does. It, it teaches us how to magnify the Lord. And she wants to give us her own soul. She wants to give us her own heart to magnify the Lord. But what did her soul have to suffer to, to receive the capacity to be the mother of us all? Because you know, most of you are probably mothers, how um, painful motherhood can be, not only physically giving birth, but the continuation of mothering, you know, of, of trying to keep your children um, close to the Lord. And, and so our Blessed Mother, it, when she brought the baby Jesus into the temple in Jerusalem 
to offer him to the Lord when he was 40 days old. And um, the Holy Spirit inspired the prophet Simeon to come into the temple and to recognize that this baby was Jesus, the Messiah. And so Simeon took the baby in his arms and said, Now I can die in peace, because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. And then he said to our blessed mother, and thy own soul, this child is set for the fall and for the rise of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be contradicted. And thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Thy own soul a sword shall pierce. Now, um, think about that, because a soul, I, I wanted to, um, in the program I put a little bit of a definition of what a soul is, because I wanted to wanted to talk about that so we can get an impression because this retreat is about the healing of the soul and it's about the, the uh, third petition of the Our Father that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how does living out that petition heal our souls and, and how did the Holy Family in particular teach us that? Well our Blessed Mother, um, first of all let's look at what a soul is. Uh, a soul, every, every living thing, St. Thomas Aquinas said, has a soul. You know, that's the animating principle, like um, like the plant. I mean, if these plants were real, they would have souls. I don't think they're real, but... Um, <laughs> it's because they look so much better than my plants, I think they must not be real. But, but a soul is the animating principle of a body, so when the soul leaves, the body dies. And um, But the only soul that is also a spirit is the human soul. Like, our souls are spirits. And Frank Sheed, I love his book, Theology for Beginners. I recommend it to you if you ever want to read a really good book. But he talks about in that book how he started out as, um, when he was a Catholic Guild evidence speaker, he had just started out and he said, um, spirit has no weight, no shape, no size, and no color. And so this man in the audience said, well, that's the best definition of nothing I've ever heard. <laughs> and so Frank Sheed went back and he said, i got to really learn what spirit is because... I can't go around teaching like this. Nobody's going to listen to me. And so he began to really study, like, what is spirit? And it's difficult to study spirit because we always think in material terms because that's all we know. I mean, we learn everything by our senses, and so we only really have access to the material wor world with our senses. So even our words, if you think about it, are only analogies. But, um, but spirit... So spirit knows, that's one characteristic, is intellect. Spirit loves, uh, so our will, our, we choose with our spirit, um, is powerful, like spirit, uh, spirit can, um, like my spirit can move my hand, your, your spirit moves your body, controls your body, but there's other spirits who are much more knowledgeable, much more loving, and much more powerful, primarily God himself, who Jesus tells us is spirit, God is spirit. And so God is all-knowing, all-loving, all and all-powerful. But we as created spirits, created out of nothing, we, we participate in that. But, but each one of us participates as an individual image of God because each one of us is unique. You, you know, think about that, that, um, you know, we're created out of nothing. And so, but and God didn't have to create us. He could have created any other group of people than us. But, but he loved us into being, and, um, and that you reflect God. You reflect God as the infinite beauty in a way that nobody else ever will again. Nobody. And, and so that's your vocation. Ultimately, your vocation is to reflect the beauty of God in whose image you were created, because it's unique. And so when you get to heaven, um, all the angels and saints are going to be rejoicing to see that new image of the God that they love, that you are. So, so let's go back for a minute to um, the Holy Family. Okay, that when, when we think about the Holy Family, we think about the same thing that we, when, when you, in Pentecost it said that um, the community of believers were of one heart and one soul, and they held all things in common. Okay, so that came about because the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the community. They were of one heart and one soul. But before that could occur, it had to occur in the Holy Family, in the family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And in particular, we think about Mary and Joseph, their marriage, their virginal marriage, and how that marriage was overshadowed by God the Holy Spirit. 
And so um, every time we're at Mass, at the Epiclesis, the, the priest will put his hands over the bread and wine and he'll call down the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit came down upon the marriage of Mary and Joseph and Jesus Christ was conceived. And so that was Jesus taking on a human nature. And I, I said to you, you know, I went 12 years to Catholic school, but, you know, it was in the 70s, so. <laughs> so I graduated without really even being able to tell you at that time that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures. I didn't really learn that with clarity until I was in the convent, which I'm ashamed to say, but it's true. So, but it's really important to know that Jesus is one person, but he's a divine person. He's the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And, but he has two natures. He has the nature of God, which he's always had, and the nature of man, which he's had since Mary said yes at the moment of the Annunciation, when she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, and the Word became flesh. And so think about, um, about what happened um, for the healing of our soul at the moment that Mary, who was, who was already legally married to Joseph at the time of the Annunciation, at the time she said yes, God took on our human nature. He, he could not have come closer to us in, in, in that he took on our human nature. But then he loves us so much that he couldn't leave us. It was like he said, well, I can't leave them. And so he left us himself in the Blessed Sacrament. So that when we receive Holy Communion, we're receiving the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus has a created soul because, because um, he has a created human nature. His body, his blood, and his soul are created, but they're united to his eternal spirit. Because, and that's mysterious, I mean, how that came about, we don't know. But we do know that when Jesus said, was, when Jesus says, I, it's God who's saying I. So everything that Jesus did, um, working as a baby, I mean, working as a little boy in the carpenter shop, um, it was God who was doing that. And I want to talk for just a minute about the holiness of St. Joseph, because, um, you know, we just had a year in honor of St. Joseph, and um, I think it really highlighted how much we're missing of a treasure that God wants to give us, which is Joseph. And um, Joseph, of all the saints, I think it was Father Don, Don Calloway who said that, you know, there have been many saints chosen to represent Jesus on the earth, but, but only one who was chosen to represent the Eternal Father, and that was St. Joseph. And he was chosen to represent the Father to Jesus Christ. So, so think about how holy he must be, that God chose him to represent himself, the Father, to the Son. And what's beautiful is that at Fatima, um, when Our Lady appeared at Fatima to three children in 1917, she appeared to um, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, who were 10, 9, and 7 years old. And she told them, um, at first people didn't believe she was really appearing to them. She was appearing on the 13th of each month. And on June 13th, she told them, in October, I will perform a miracle so that all may believe. And St. Joseph will come with the baby Jesus to bless the world. And so that did occur, as you, if you know the story of Fatima. On October 13, 1917, in the presence of 70,000 people, the miracle of the sun occurred, which um, had been foretold by Our Lady that would occur at noon on October 13, 1917. The only, par I mean, the only miracle that was predicted in time before that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But, but Mary predicted, she said, this is going to happen on this day at this time, and it did. But during the miracle of the sun, which um, I don't know if you've studied much about Fatima, but the sun was giving off all different colors of light, all different beautiful colors, and um, the people could look right at it. And then it seemed like it was going to crash into the earth, and people thought it was the end of the world. So some people were yelling out their sins. And, um, and then the, the sun returned to its normal place. This occurred it, taking 12 minutes of time. And even though it had rained all night long, and some people had been out in the field all night, um, when they looked down, the ground was completely dry and all their clothes were dry. So that was what the people saw. And um, some of them were atheists prior to that. You know, even like some of the um, secular newspapers had come just to make fun of it. But, but they were like kneeling on the ground after it was over. But, but meanwhile, Lucia and Jacinta and Francisco were seeing something different that the, the people weren't seeing. And, um, 
one of the things that Lucia said she saw, and I want to read it to you because I have it written down on, from her memoirs. Okay, this is the actual words of Lucia later when she was in the comment she wrote this. After Our Lady had disappeared into the immense distance of the firmament, we beheld St. Joseph with the child Jesus and Our Lady robed in white with a blue mantle. I like that because I mean, that's our heaven. <laughs> Beside the sun. St. Joseph and the child Jesus seemed to bless the world for they traced the sign of the cross with their hands. I mean, that is just amazing when you think about it. Joseph blessed the world with Jesus. And so think about that from a biblical point of view. Like if you know the story of um, Isaac and Jacob and Esau from the Old Testament where um, Jacob and Esau were twins. Abraham was, Abraham, um, Abraham's son was Isaac and Isaac's um, wife Rebecca gave birth to Jacob and Esau but Esau was born first. So in, the, in a Jewish family of that time, the, the firstborn son inherited the father's blessing and also um, the, the highest share of his wealth. And so, so Jacob, um, at one point, um, Esau had come in from the field and Jacob was cooking something, uh, stew or something, and, um, and Esau said, give me some of that red stew. And, um, and Jacob said, well, first sell me your first birthright. And um, so Esau was so hungry, he said, okay, you can, you can have it. And so then he ate the stew, but he had sold his first birthright to his younger brother, Jacob. And so when it came time, Isaac became blind when he was elderly, and, um, and he wanted to give his oldest son the blessing before he died. And so, and so he told Esau, go out and hunt for some, some meat and um, prepare it the way I like, and then I'll give you my blessing. And so Rebecca, meanwhile, Isaac's wife was spying on him. And she heard him say that. So, so she went and um, got her son Jacob, who was her, like, her favorite son. And she said, go and get two small goats out of the flock and um, bring them to me. And I'm going to prepare them for your father. And he'll give you the blessing. And, and Jacob was a little hesitant because he thought, you know, if this goes wrong, I'm going to be in big trouble. But, but he believed his mother, you know. And so, she, so he went and got the two the two small goats, and I don't know where he had to get to. But then um, she cooked them, and, and then Jacob brought them in. And um, Esau was very hairy, so um, Rebecca had put these like goat skins on his hands, so the father would think that that was Esau. I guess he was more than just blind. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, when, when Jacob came in, and um, he said, I've come, Father, to receive your blessing, and, and he did manage to trick Isaac into thinking that he was Esau. And so um, Isaac gave him the blessing, the father's blessing. And so um, then when Esau came back, he was like ready to murder Jacob. So I mean, you can read the rest of that story in Genesis, but the reason I bring up that story to you is, well, for two reasons. One is, um, like St. Louis de Montfort in his book, True Devotion to Mary, he's, he compares that story to our blessed mother getting the blessing for us. And um, it's really kind of what she does do. She gets us the blessing of the firstborn, which is her son, Jesus. But Jesus wants us to have that blessing. He, he wants us to have his blessing. But look at this scene in Fatima that um, Jesus, as a baby, is choosing to bless the world with, with the fatherly blessing of St. Joseph. You know, that he is giving us that blessing. And so he's blessing the whole church. And um, because our blessed mother and St. Joseph lived with Jesus in Nazareth, um, we can see them as a kind of new Adam and Eve. You know, that Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden, and it's like Sister um, Esther Marie in her talk was saying how, um, how it, it says that, um, John Paul II says, original sin attempts to abolish fatherhood be, because um, if you think of the temptation of Eve, Satan said to her, I mean, under the form of the serpent, Satan said, um, did God really say? You know, so he, he sows doubt into Eve's mind about the Father. And, and so what we're always trying to get back to, as Sister Esther Meek brought out so well, is that trust in the Father. But it's hard for us to trust the Father, especially if we haven't had fathers who were loving. Um, so, so we need to have Joseph and Mary 
come and help us to recover because they're perfect parents. They're perfect human parents and they can help heal all those wounds that we have in our soul either because we've been abused or because we have in some way abused others by our sins. Okay, because we're, we're all sinners and um, we've all been sinned against. So, so that leaves wounds in our soul that makes it difficult to pray. Like Our Lady said, the two obstacles to prayer, I told you before, are sin and worry. And um, we have to first know what our sins are. But that's partly what, what happened when her soul was pierced with a sword, was so that the thoughts of many hearts could be revealed, that uh, Our Lady helps us to know what our sins are so that we can repent. And, um, you know, sometimes people, um, they're afraid to go to confession, you know. They, they think, oh no, the priest is going to see me, and they're going to, the next time they look at me, they're going to say, you did that? <laughs> but, you know, that's not true. That, that's, that's a lie of Satan. Okay, the priest, like, they, he, they've heard all the sins, all the sins they've heard. And besides, Jesus said, um, he said to St. Faustina one time, my, my mercy is greater than all your sins, and it's greater than all the sins of the world. So, so um, if his mercy is greater than all the sins of the world, it's certainly greater than your sins. And, and so you should never think that, um, or maybe another thing people think, they, they think, oh no, I haven't gone to confession since I was in second grade. I can't remember what to do. Like the priest's going to think, you know, you're kidding me. You don't know how to go to confession. <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you what goes on in people's minds. I think. And so, but that's another lie of Satan. Okay, because if you don't know how to go to confession, the priest is going to help you. And the the basic thing you have to do at confession is confess your sins. That's the most important thing, and to be sorry for them, and, and not to hide them out of shame because like I said the priest has heard all the sins and he's just rejoicing like imagine if you had that ability to forgive people's sins wouldn't you rejoice if uh, someone came and, and brought some big sins to you and um, asked you in the name of God to forgive them that you could restore life to that soul like St. Augustine said it's a greater thing for God to forgive a mortal sin than to create the universe it's a greater thing because the universe is finite, but, but the soul is not. The soul is eternal. The soul's going to go on forever. I mean, we, we're not eternal in the sense of God because we had a beginning, but we don't have an end. We're immortal souls. And so um, that's another characteristic of spirit is that it doesn't occupy space because it has no parts. Like, like you can't say, well, my, I remember when I was a little kid, um, I made my first confession in first grade. And then um, it was the day before my first communion, and I had this sister, Theodore Agnes, was my teacher, and she told us um, when we went to confession, she said, now be careful not to spill the grace out of your soul. And so I remember walking home from school that day, and um, I was like walking like this. <laughs> and I was so worried that the grace was going to spill out of my soul. And, and so, but I think we all sometimes tend to have that vision of the soul as if it's the same shape as our body, and uh, you know, just like kind of transparent but but that's really not the soul our soul is not in space and um so it, it doesn't need space it's like the angels the angels are not really in space either they don't need space space is a limitation the need for space and so um think about your guardian angel for example who's with you right now and who's always praying to god always seeing god face to face and praying for you at the same time loving you and um, trying to put good thoughts into your heart, trying to reassure you that um, you have been forgiven. God wants to forgive you. He loves you with an infinite love. And just think about um, what was the hardest thing for Jesus during his passion, do you think? What was the greatest suffering? Does anyone know? The greatest suffering of Jesus was unrequited love unrequited love because he said greater love than this no one has that one lay down his life for his friends you are my friends if you do the things I command you and so has anyone else been nailed for you has anyone else been scourged for you and mocked and crowned with thorns but Jesus has been because because Jesus would have done that even if you were the only one he would have done it that's how valuable your soul is to him. Your soul is infinitely valuable to him. And, and he could have redeemed the world just with one drop of his precious blood, or just by saying a word, you know. He, he could have, because he's all-powerful. He's God. 
But no, he chose to go through this gruesome murder, allow himself to be murdered and beaten and um, savagely beaten so that you would know how much he loves you and so that you would look at him and know that um, his mercy is for you. So please, um, if you haven't gone to confession, go back to confession because God's waiting. He wants to pour out so much grace into your soul. He wants you to become a great saint. You, you know, a saint who will influence so many other souls for good. And I know that um, some of you probably are praying for your children. I know we all have relatives and friends who um, are away from the Lord. And but, but the way that we can most bring souls to Jesus Christ is by allowing him to love us. Like it says in the Song of Songs, begins with, um, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, for, for thy breasts are better than wine. Draw me, we will run after thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. And so St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, I told the sister she's been pursuing me this year, <laughs> and, um, but, but she said one time, she said, she understood that to mean draw me and we will run after thee. Um, that when she would be draw, allow herself to be drawn by the Lord, that other souls would be drawn after her. And so, so if you're worried about your sons or daughters or your brothers or sisters, as I'm worried about my brother and sister, um, let yourself be drawn by the Lord so that he can bring, um, he will bring healing to their souls. The, the more we allow God to love us, the greater our capacity for receiving his love, the more our love will influence them, more so than our words. Like one quote I read of St. Teresa, let me just explain this to you because you won't know what I'm talking about, but um, like every, every All Saints Day, um, Sister Eucharist has started this good custom in our association where um, she gets all these names of saints and puts them into a bag and quotes from the saints, and then you have to pick out one for the year that's going to be your saint for the year. And so this year I picked out St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, and um, you know, she's always seemed like a little too good for me. Like, you know, I just think, you know, she's not my style of saint. But, <laughs> but, but then she, um, she seems to be pursuing me. Like, like three days ago, I'll show you. Three days ago, I get this in the mail from a, a place I don't even belong to. <laughs> you know, so I said, okay, well, <laughs> so I guess, I guess she's trying to get my attention. But, but then I read this quote of hers. Um, about how, and it really struck me, in fact, last night I was dreaming about it, and she said, um, you will do more, I found out that I can do more with love and sacrifice than I can do with my words. And so I thought that's so important, and I want to end with that thought, that we can do more with love and sacrifice than we can do with our words. So um, I thank you very much, and um, it's been a beautiful day with you, and um, I hope that you'll be able to buy our books and um, that continue to pray for our daughter, the Daughters of Mary, Mother of Healing Love, and know that we will continue to pray for all of you.